it truly it's 90 degrees now in this classroom and it is like it is sweltering i called mona and i'm like this is crazy we need to get some air conditioning in here so she's supposed to be calling Never security and yes exactly so thank you so much i appreciate it of course thank you you bet and i will also post this powerpoint because i did forget to start the recording at the beginning so just kind of a heads up Thank you, though, for letting me know. I really appreciate it. All right. Can everyone see the PowerPoint presentation again? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so next is the physically challenged patients, neuromuscular disease, paralysis, mm -hmm. <clears throat> physical deformities that are congenital in nature or acquired, sensory impairment, vision, hearing, and again, those patients um, that may be hard of hearing, so they can't, they can't hear anesthesia say, take deep breaths, or hey, move over to this bed, um, and sometimes that's where we kind of have to drop our mask down and let them read our lips. Speech. <clears throat> so maybe they aren't able to communicate. Mentally or emotionally challenged patients. Those with disabilities, such as Down syndrome, autism. Those with post-traumatic stress disorder, learning disabilities fetal drug or alcohol syndrome, mental illnesses such as paranoia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or mental retardation. So all of these types of mental illnesses I mean, are very common that we see in the OR, right? It's stuff that we, um, you know, I think is very common in our society now. And patients may not be taking their medications or they may be coming in through the ER. Um, so as they're coming out of anesthesia, we've had those that maybe have been addicted to painkillers and they don't wanna take painkillers, but they come out of anesthesia in pain and you, and they come up swinging, you know, wanting to get off the bed. So again, as a scrub tech, that's where you really want to jump in and kind of help. Don't put yourself in dangerous way, but make sure that you're there being able to help the CRNA and the nurse as this patient wakes up. Isolation patients. And these are patients who have an infectious disease that could spread microorganisms to staff or other patients. So they're usually on strict isolation, contact isolation. So usually they have the yellow gowns. You'll see nurses or CNAs, you know, they're wearing masks, gloves as they go in there, as they go into a patient's room. Um, same with if they have C. diff. Um, we also treat patients with TB like this. Reverse isolation. All right, and trauma patients. Patients with a physical wound or injury, such as a fracture or blow, traumatic brain injury. Patients with language, cultural, or religious barriers. A non-native speaking patient is any patient in which English is not their primary language. Patients require a translator. <clears throat> A language barrier is the most common barrier in any healthcare setting and is found to be a risk factor with adverse outcomes. So again, many, many different cultures live inside of our community and we try to provide translators in all of our healthcare settings, right? St. Luke, St. Al's, everybody tries to provide a translator. And again, I want you as scrub techs to put yourself in the patient's shoes. You're in a country where you don't understand the language. And for whatever reason it is, whether it be refugees, um, they're here visiting family, whatever the reason is, 
they still may not be able to you know understand the English language and how scary that is um, lots of our our translators at St. Al's are great um, you want to make sure you have a translator that is able to fully communicate any questions or concerns the patient may have. You know, sometimes uh, if a translator is not able to maybe convey the risks, um, that could be a big issue. I'm sorry, I keep hearing little noises. Everybody good? Oh, there we go. I'm seeing questions. You bet. All right, I'm going to jump back real fast. I'm seeing these comments. So Alessandra um, stated, can you please tell me one example of PTSD? So I can actually no, do this on a... I didn't know. What yeah. Yeah, so post-traumatic stress disorder. So Lindsay, great comment. So okay. your war veterans, um, trauma or assault. We also have seen this in pediatric patients. So sometimes if we have patients that are maybe wards of the state or they came from kind of a rough upbringing, uh, when you take them back to the operating room and they're small, they don't understand that they're going to wake up from anesthesia, kind of like what we talked about last week. And they also panic thinking that they're being taken away from maybe their foster family or their adoptive family. So they end up having that PTSD and they just, it, truly, it's terrifying for them, you know, and they're crying and screaming. Um, your PTSD can be patients that may go into a room with a male nurse and they've been abused in the past by a spouse. And, and same with males, you know, maybe they had a mother that was abusive. And so they have that PTSD and maybe their, their CRNA is a female, you know, that looks like their mom and something could cause a trigger um, for that patient. Does that make sense, Alessandra? Yes, yes thank you. Okay, you bet. All right, let me go uh, on these other Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, perfect, Greg. Yeah, um, I, I know of an example. I, I have a friend that uh, his mom was basically, um, it was Munchausen by proxy. You, you understand? Mm. Yeah. So basically, like, yeah. in his early life, he was basically poisoned by his mom, like, all the time to keep him sick so that he would be really dependent on her. He was able to get out of that situation when he was like 11 or 12, but yeah, something like, like, hey, here's here's your medicine, that type of stuff. It became really traumatic for him because, I mean, for the longest time he was trusting someone to take care of him, and then it it turns out it was all a lie, you know? Yeah, and so that that person later on in life will have massive trust issues. Oh yeah. With. Yeah, right, with anyone in that position. So, you know, he may, he may not trust the medical community if they say, you know, take this medication. E even yeah. if it's for something like, um, what, acid reflux, right? Mm -hmm. You know, something very minor, but he's like, no, you know, I'm not taking that. I have, I trusted yeah. people in the past and, you know, I'm not doing that any longer. So, great comment, Ray, thank you. Yeah. Thankfully, he's been able to, like, he, he he trusts now, but it took him a long time to get to that point, you know? A lot of good doctors. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. There we go. No, that's a great comment. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Professor, Professor Angel? Yeah. I was also curious um, how often the, like, the isolation patients, like, you come across that with TB and stuff? Uh, it seems <laughs> kind of intense. Yes. So truly, it, it you could have five in a week and you may not have any in a week. Um, you know, they're fairly common up on the med surge floor or any of the patient floors. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, like MRSA and C. diff are, can be transferred from patient to patient by healthcare providers. Oh. So it it can be fairly common on the floors. Um, in the OR, we don't see it a whole lot. You know, you may have um, a patient with MRSA or a history of MRSA would probably be the most likely. I'm, I'm trying to think back in my 20 years of experience, what we saw. I would think that MRSA, so you really don't see it that often. And in the operating room, as a scrub tech, you have on your gown 
you know, gloves, mask anyways. So it's not as big as a transition as it is maybe on the floor mm -hmm. or like a long-term living facility. But we probably see like maybe MRSA or a history of MRSA is our most common one. And again, you may see five in a week and you may not see any for a couple weeks. Okay, gotcha. The only um, thing that I remember the book mentioning was about TB. So I was curious yes. how many differences yeah. there were, were as a concern. Yeah, and, and we honestly, when I very first started at St. Al's 22 years ago, I think I was exposed to TB the first month I was there. <laughs> and then maybe a year later, I was exposed again. But after that, I, you know, I think TB is a pretty, um, what do I want to say? Not very common, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a history of TB, but in the operating room, we honestly don't treat them any different than we would any other patient because we're already in a mask, you know, with a gown, all of that type of stuff. Obviously, if, it, if they do have TB, we'll wear an N95 and just kind of take that precaution. But besides that, we don't, we honestly don't see TB that often anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. I was just curious. Hey, you bet. <laughs> yeah, great question. All right, so language barriers. And again, if you can have a translator there, um, and it cannot be a family member, that's a, a big no-no, um, simply because a family member hasn't been trained on uh, maybe medical terminology, and so they, they may not be able to convey to the patient what the doctor is saying. Um, as a family member, it's a last resort, but I think both St. Luke's, St. Al's, and other healthcare providers in the Valley try really, really hard to bring in hired translators um, for patients that may have a language barrier. Cultural or religious practices that vary from the majority of the population. And I kind of mentioned this last week too. They may request an all female crew. Um, I know that we've had patients down in LND before that want a female CRNA to put in their epidural or their spinal. And I will tell you, healthcare facilities will do their 110% to try to make this happen. So they're extremely supportive of you know, any sort of cultural um, practices. I know down in L&D and Alessandri may be able to back me up. We used to have patients that their family members may bring, um, would bring in food uh, every single day for them. And it was great. And the, the whole entire community, you know, of that particular patient would come in and see them. Obviously with COVID, that's not allowed anymore. Um, and, you know, and so we'd keep the food in the refrigerator for them because that was part of their culture. Substance abuse patients, patients who consume a substance in amounts or with methods neither approved nor supervised by medical professionals. Um, these can sometimes have a pretty significant effect in the operating room. We've had patients before that you thought were healthy patients um, and they went to intubate and the patient coded and we had no idea why. And a week later, the provider comes back, and apparently the patient had intravenously been taking cocaine, but he honestly had no idea. And they don't do urinalysis on patients before they come to the operating room. Sometimes I wish they did just for the safety of the patients. Um, but truly, a, a, I think she was maybe in her mid-40s, you know, just your standard patient, um, and she'd been in, in injecting it in between her toes. So, you know, your toes isn't something that you can see the injections from, but sh her heart stopped from the drug abuse. Um, and we coded her, I think, you know, when you're running the code, it feels like hours upon hours. And it maybe was two to three minutes, um, brought her back. She was discharged from the hospital. And then she admitted to our provider, one of our surgeons, that she'd actually been a pretty heavy drug user um, for the past couple of years. We also have patients that will have family members um, or they themselves may sneak in pain medications. Uh, and so they're double dosing on the floors. And, you know, as you guys can imagine, that can be a pretty serious issue. All right. Patients with 
hematological disorders. So they may be anemic, hemophilia, bloodborne pathogen diseases, hepatitis B and C, HIV. All right, next is patients with severe allergies. So it can, and allergies can exacerbate asthma. They can have medication allergies, latex allergies. Most healthcare facilities in the Treasure Valley are trying to get rid of latex in general. So we used to have latex gloves. And honestly, both facilities are trying to get rid of latex gloves. We used to have latex drains. They're trying to get rid of those as well. Um, with allergies, it can start out as a sensitivity, and then over time, it could result in anaphylactic type shock. So in general, patient safety-wise, all healthcare facilities are really trying to be careful with how much latex products come into uh, their building. Patients with sexually related disorders, so they may have reproductive issues. They may have had abortions in the past cancer of reproductive organs, infertility procedures such as in vitro fertilizations, gender issues, maybe transgender. They may be having a penile prosthesis implantation, high risk pregnancy patients. And these are pregnancies with a greater chance of complications and we call those our high risk pregnancies. Complications of pregnancy can result in dysfunctional labor and difficult delivery, fetal distress, maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. Health problems may develop during a pregnancy that makes it high risk, such as gestational diabetes or preeclampsia. The following factors may increase the risk of problems during pregnancy. So very young age or older than 35, I had my children at 38 and older, and I was labeled as AMA, which is advanced maternal age. It was plastered all over my, my chart. I wasn't real happy about it, but there are higher risks um, once you reach the age of 35 or older. Same with being very young. If you're extremely overweight or underweight, it, it, can, it can increase the risk of problems. Um, problems in previous pregnancy, so maybe um, their cervix opened up early, you know, and they had a premature baby. They may have also hemorrhaged with their previous um, children. Health conditions patients um, have before becoming pregnant, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, cancer, and HIV. Pregnancy with twins or other multiples. psychological and psychosocial, mental or behavioral functioning. So loss of dignity, fear of the unknown or of pain, fear of separation or leaving loved ones. We kind of talked about that with the um, children. Fear of the surgical process, right? I think all of us have a general fear of surgery, right? It's pain. Um, not sure what the outcome may be or how much pain you'll be in uh, when you wake up from the anesthesia. Uh, mutilation or de debilitation. Um, mistrust, founded or unfounded in personnel. And Ray kind of mentioned that. Concern for any unfish unfinished business. And that may be a patient that's going in for a risky procedure, right? Anytime you have brain surgery, it's a pretty risky, pretty risky procedure or a heart, open heart surgery. Um, and so patients may want to make sure that they have everything taken care of, you know, their wills taken care of, all their finances are in order. Uh, the fear of death, you know, that can be terrifying as a patient. Um, that they'll never wake up again, or that something will happen on the operating room table and, and that they won't ever get to see their family members again. Concern for the patient by patient support system. So family members. So physical, so this is your physical functioning. <clears throat> 
personal hygiene. Sometimes if you have patients with mental illnesses or older patients, they may not bathe properly. Uh, nutritional and fluid needs, they may be dehydrated or they may not be consuming enough calories. And the hard part with this is for a body to recover from a surgery, you really have to eat, you know, eat, provide your body with calories, make sure that you're staying hydrated. Um, pain control, make sure that the, the patient has the pain medication that they need to be comfortable. Uh, spiritual, fundamental beliefs or religious faith. Finding comfort and support in religious faith. And I think that there are, I, I know at St. Al's we used to have a book of people that we could call if a patient requested um, maybe their pastor or their bishop or their priest, and they would come in and administer, administer to them or pray with them or, or uh, you know, provide comfort in whatever manner their religion um, kind of supported. A need for meaning, hope in the face of death or chronic illness, right? I, I think even when we're dying, that, that we still want to have hope. All right, so how to approach the psychosocial aspects of caring for special needs patients. So our general approach, we want to remain objective. Okay. You, you, you don't want to downplay their feelings by any means. Be proactive and refrain from being reactive. Continuously monitor nonverbal cues. Frequently assess patients and families' understanding. Create general communication. Use simple, direct communication. And we've probably all felt this somewhere in our life. You've met with a medical provider and they use all medical terminology and it is in a, you know, they're up on level nine with their medical terminology and you have to go home and research what they said and kind of hope that you remember the exact words that they used. So my father's 85, he has some health issues and it, when he goes to the doctor, he can come home, you know, and I'll say, hey, what the what the doctor say? I'm using this as an example because we never let him go to the doctor by himself anymore. Either one of my sisters and I are always with him. Um, but he'll say, oh, yeah, he says I'm in good health and every, everything's great. We go the next time. Well, come to find out the provider told him, hey, you have high blood pressure. You know, your diabetes is uncontrolled. Um, I think you need to follow up. Um, with your general practitioner about your feet, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you really want to be able to use direct communication, um, maybe write a list for the patient, you know, hey, you need to follow up with your provider regarding your feet um, and your diabetes. Uh, follow up with your heart doctor. Um, so I think as you guys move more into the medical field, make sure that you are remembering to really use simple direct communication if you're dealing with family members or patients themselves. Focus on the task and repeat information as needed, especially for those who may have a language barrier or may be hard of hearing um, or may you know, just kind of have a hard time understanding cognitively. Be empathetic. Right, we never know if that's someone's mom, grandma, daughter. And respect cultural values. Avoid communication blocks and cliches and do not offer false hope. I have learned in the past, don't ever say it's a minor procedure because it may turn out to not be a minor procedure. We never know what will happen during the operation. Um, again, don't downplay their feelings. Oh, everything will be okay. You don't need to worry, right? We don't, we don't know what the future holds. Um, the patient may end up having a stroke or a heart attack on the table, right? For something very minor, like a, like a small hernia repair. Have a 
have the patient and or family repeat information to ensure understanding. And that's definitely a big one in general with your elderly patients, um, pediatric patients, you know, family members, the parents or the guardians, they're already overwhelmed. So again, maybe write it down and then go over it with them a, a second time so that they can process it. Those with language barriers, again, you may wanna have the translator write it down um, or, or repeat it to them and make sure that they, that they understand or that the translation has been correct. Keep those that need to know informed of status as permitted by the physicians. So for those of you that have had family members inside the operating room or in some sort of procedure, that can be some of the longest hours of your life. And those phone calls, our nurses are supposed to call every hour to let the family members know that everything's going okay and can give them an update as long as the physician has okayed it. So remember that your, your nurse may be, you know, maybe busy. Um, they may have switched nurses, you know, maybe one went home because it was the end of her shift. Um, she may have gone to lunch and thought that her lunch relief called to the family. So remind your circulator, um, hey, have you, you know, have you updated the family? And, and, and you may not need to, you may have a nurse that's on top of that all the time, but those phone calls can really provide some pretty significant um, emotional relief to family members. So general physical considerations for those caring um, for special needs patients. So your, your general approach, be proactive and we, we kind of mentioned this before, refrain from being reactive. You want to continuously monitor vitals. Frequently assess the physical cues. You know, is a patient squinting in pain? Um, are they clenching their fists? Uh, are they tightening their muscles? General actions, use physical reass reassurance as required. Okay, we're going to you know, go ahead and, and um, put, so here's something that we do. When positioning patients in the operating room, we put their arms out, they aren't at their side. And so we also put a safety belt across their legs. And so you really wanna talk to them through and just say, hey, we're just, we're just putting a safety belt across your legs. You know, it's not gonna hold you down. It's just so that your legs don't fall off the operating room table as we're doing the procedure. Really explain to the patients what you're doing. Respond to physical distress. Is this causing you pain? Does your back hurt? Those with back pain, having their legs um, straight on the operating table and not having them elevated with pillows can cause a lot of pain. So we really like to make sure that we have pillows in the operating room, um, which we do anyways for positioning. But if you see a patient in pain, you know it may just be that their IV is wrapped around their arm or an EKG lead is, you know, again, underneath their back. So make sure that you respond. You know, if you see them squinting or kind of moving around on the operating room table, is something bothering you? A blanket maybe wrapped around their body? You know, simple stuff like that. Proactively manage appropriate perioperative physical issues. Assist contact with facility support resources, such as social worker or a chaplain. So we've had to do this before if we knew a patient wasn't gonna make it off the table. Um, when you deal with traumas, before, before COVID hit, when we had a trauma, such as someone rolling their vehicle on the freeway and maybe they were ejected and they were um, essentially dying on the table. We knew that we can't get them up to ICU for their family members to say goodbye. Uh, we will call in a chaplain, um, someone that will be there to support the family as, as they're told that their family member didn't make it through the, through the operation. Uh, a social worker. Sometimes my, my spouse works at St. Luke's and deals a lot with these difficult cases. And so you may have, in labor and delivery, you may have a patient that is homeless or maybe is addicted to meth. Or, or some other medication. 
and you have to call in a social worker um, because the baby has tested positive for drugs or maybe the baby doesn't have a safe home to go to. So sometimes you'll be kind of asked to, to contact these people. Respect each patient's right to religious preferences without any attempt to alter or modify their beliefs. Make every effort to honor any special spiritual requests by responding or contacting support staff that can respond appropriately. And again, at St. Al's, I know that we keep, I think we keep oil uh, for the LDS religion. I think that they keep water for final right, or, and I may not be saying that right, and I apologize, um, and the, for the Catholic religion. Um, and so I know that both healthcare facilities try to really keep religious um, water oils available to patients um, if someone wants to give a blessing or provide um, the final rites. Am I saying that correctly? Nobody's commenting, so I must be. <laughs> All right, allow, sorry, go ahead. No, I just say, I don't know. <laughs> I know, I know that we have water and oil though at St. Al's and I know that they do at Luke's as well. Um, so allow religious cultural symbols according to the policy. All right, caring for aging patients. So psychosocial, aging patients may be mentally confused for a variety of reasons. So it is important to speak slowly and distinctly. And again, hard of hearing. Many older patients are hard of hearing and they may not tell you that and so they'll just shake their head yes. So really make sure that they understand. Making it important, so speak loudly. They may have one ear that they hear better with than the other. Aging patients need to be handled gently, um, but firmly without rushing them. So you don't, um, when they say firmly, don't think rough. Uh, you really wanna make sure that a patient doesn't fall, those older patients. So handle them gently, but at the same time, make sure that they're stable. Maybe when they get up to leave, um, make sure that they have access to their walkers, uh, canes, don't rush them because if they feel rushed, they may fall. Assistance should be offered, but if possible, allow patients to be independent as possible. So physical care, patients need to be lifted, not pulled during transfer to and from the operating table since the skin is thin and sensitive. Patients must be positioned carefully on the operating room table to prevent pressure points. So extra pillows, blankets, and padding may be needed. Aging patients have a diminished and slower blood flow. Therefore, they are more inclined to blood clots and may require um, anti-embolic stockings, which I will, it, most of our patients end up with thromboguards and that's, um, they help move the blood, the flow of blood during surgeries, right? Um, but with your elderly patients, you may need to put on the stockings. Does everybody know what the stockings are? It's those white kind of nylon-y type material that are extremely difficult to put on. Um, but you may need to put that on, on your elderly patients to prevent blood clots. Blood loss must be monitored and promptly replaced. Right, so your elderly patients have a lower h and hematocrit and hemoglobin, um, so they may not clot as quickly as a middle-aged adult. Environmental, aging patients are very susceptible to infection. Extra precautions may be needed to preserve the patient's body temperature. Raising the room temperature applying warm blankets when patient arrives and leaves the OR. That is something with our elderly patients. We will wrap it around their feet, you know, take warm blankets out of the warmer, wrap one around their feet, um, put a couple on their body, 
make sh we've even um, wrapped one around patient's heads before because of course that's where heat can escape. Using a hypohyperthermia mattress or a reflective blanket on the operating table. So those are our warmers. Warming, irrigating and intravenous fluids, including blood. And Jordan and I kind of talked about this in the hospital tour, but that they're finding out that a patient's temperature has a significant um, relation to how patients recover from their surgery. So if you know, you're doing a big belly case and they're irrigating with quite a few liters of saline, make sure that's warm for your patient. Keeping the patient covered as much as possible during positioning and prepping to limit skin exposure. Minimizing time of exposure between skin antisepsis and draping procedures and leaving the head cap on the patient after the operation. Specialized monitoring equipment and temperature control units may be used on aging patients to more closely monitor their vital signs and alert the OR to any emergencies. So we use uh, heart leads, right? And our, on our elderly patients, we may use more leads just to kind of watch their heart a little better. Aging patients present special challenges to the anesthesiologist. Fitting a mask may be difficult due to the loss of teeth. They are more prone to post-operative complications such as hypotension, hypothermia, cerebral edemia, and hypoxia. Factors which can contribute to surgical difficulties and chronic problems. Organ function, how well is their liver and kidney functioning, right? Sometimes we'll have patients come in that and I'm sure you guys already know this, but one of the questions that is asked for every single patient in the operating room, how much alcohol do you drink? Do you drink alcohol? What kind of alcohol? And then how much do you drink? And with some of your patients, you usually multiply it by three. So, oh yeah, I, I have maybe, you know, maybe a six pack of beer at night. Um, However, this patient isn't responding to pain medications real well because their liver metabolizes quickly. So with your older patients, if you have some that are kind of heavy drinkers, um, their liver and kidneys may not function real well. The digestive tract, eyes and ears. So are they hard of hearing? Do they have a hard time seeing? Respiration. Sometimes our older patients, we have to keep them at a slightly elevated level um, because if they lay flat, they're not able to breathe real well. Metabolic, kind of what I just mentioned, right? Your kidney, your liver, your pancreas. Structural integrity. So your tissue issues, um, when they put tegaderms or tape to hold the IV, is it causing any skin irritation? Is the skin ripping? So blood supply, do they have okay blood supply, like maybe to their bowels because you're doing a bowel resection or to their legs because you're doing a total knee or maybe you're working on the ankle. So a wound will not heal if it doesn't have good blood supply. Nerves. And then your skin turgor. All right. So we're gonna take a short break here. So you guys can get a drink, run to the bathroom, and then we're gonna watch a quick video before we jump back to objective 10. Any questions or concerns? Is everybody staying cool? This weather is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, can everybody see the screen? It should say inside the mind of a master procrastinator. No. No, okay. Yeah, I can see it now. Perfect. Thank you. All right, everybody back from their break. So I'm not showing this video. Oh, perfect. I'm not showing this video aimed at anyone. I have been a college student. Um, I still am. I just I received my master's a couple years ago. Um, I have a couple different degrees, so I fully understand college students um, and I understand life in general. So I'm going to show you this video. I don't know if you guys have ever heard, or heard of TED Talks. They're absolutely fabulous. Um, so this one is all about inside the mind of a master procrastinator. So he, here's what I, I want you guys to think. And I've been getting some emails, phone calls, text messages, etc. I know it's summertime and I know it's tough. You have families, uh, you have other stuff going on. And truly, here's what I finally realized. I think I was, I don't know, maybe in my late 30s before I realized this. It doesn't matter how long I procrastinate, the assignment and the reading is still gonna be there, right? Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter how much I hated the assignment or how much or, or how boring the material was in the book, uh, it was still gonna be there at the end of the week, or it was still gonna be there 24 hours before the deadline. So anyways, I just kinda wanted to break up this lecture because I know it's kind of, um, it's important material, but two, hour, two to three hours of lecturing on this material can be a little dry. So I'm just gonna add in a couple of videos just, just to kind of break things up. They're super short. So in, college, so in college, I was a government, was a government major, major, which means I had to write, a lot, write a lot of papers. Now, when a normal now, student writes a paper, student paper, they might spread the, they work, spread out the work out a little like, like this. So, you know, so, you, know you get started you maybe get a little slowly. You get enough, you get done, enough done in the first done week, the first week that, that some heavier days later on, everything gets done and it stays civil. And I would want to do that. Like that. That would be the plan. I would have it all ready to go. But then actually the people would come along, and then I would kind of do this. And that would happen every single paper. But then came my ninth grade senior thesis. Paper you're supposed to spend a year on. I knew for a paper like that, like a normal that, workflow, normal work flow, not an option, not it was way too big a project. Big so I planned things I planned out things and I decided, out, and I decided they kind of had, had to go had something, to like go this. something like this. This is how the year would go. Year would so go. I'd start so off slight and I'd bump and it up I'd in the middle up months and then at the end I would kick it up to high gear. How hard is it? How hard is it? No big deal, right? But then the funniest thing happened in those first few months. They came and went, came and I went, couldn't, and quite, I couldn't quite do stuff. So we had an awesome, had an new, awesome revised new revised plan. plan. And then, and then, but then those middle then those months middle actually, months went, actually by, went by, and I didn't really, and write, I didn't words. really write words. And, and so we're here. So we're here. And then two months, and then two months turned into one turned month. Into one month. Turned, turned into two turned weeks. Into two weeks. And one day I woke one up. One day I woke up with three with days, three days until, the until the deadline. Still not having Still not written, written, a word. written a word. And so I did the, so only, I thing did I the only thing I could. I wrote 90, I wrote 90 pages, pages over 72, 72 hours, hours pulling not one, but two, two all-nighters. All Humans, Humans are not supposed to pull two all-nighters. Two all-nighters. Sprinted, Sprinted across, across campus, campus dove in slow, dove motion, slow motion, and got it in got just at the deadline. The deadline. I thought that was the end of everything. But a week later, I get a call. It's the school. School. And they say, and they say Tim, Tim Urban, and I say, yeah, yeah. And they say, we need they to talk, about, need your talk about your thesis. And I say, okay, say, okay. And they say, and they say, it's the best one we've ever seen. We've seen. <laughs> that did not happen.
was a very, very bad thesis. I just wanted to enjoy that one moment when all of you thought this guy is amazing. No, no, it was very, very bad. Anyway, today I'm a writer, blogger, guy. I write the blog Wait But Why, and a couple of years ago I decided to write about procrastination. My behavior has always perplexed the non-procrastinators around me, and I wanted to explain to the non-procrastinators of the world what goes on in the heads of procrastinators and why we are the way we are. Now, I had a hypothesis that the, the brains of procrastinators were actually different than the brains of other people. And to test this, I found an MRI lab that actually let me scan both my brain and the brain of a proven non-procrastinator. And, I, and so I could compare them, and I actually brought them here to show you today. And I want you to take a look carefully to see if you can notice a difference. And I know that if you're not a trained brain expert, it's not that obvious. Just take a look, okay? So here's the brain of a non-procrastinator. <laughs> Now, here's my brain. There is a difference. Both brains have a rational decision maker in them, but the procrastinator's brain also has an instant gratification monkey. Now, what does this mean for the procrastinator? Well, it means everything's fine until this happens. So the rational decision maker will make the rational decision to do something productive, but the monkey doesn't like that plan. So he actually takes the wheel and he says, "Actually, let's read the entire Wikipedia page of the Nancy Kerrigan Tanya Hart." Scandal, because I just remember that that happened. <laughs> then, then we're going to go over. That's a pretty good article. Been doing there since 10 minutes ago. After that, we're going to go on a YouTube spiral that starts with videos of Richard Feynman talking about magnets and ends much, much later with us watching interviews with Justin Bieber's mom. <laughs> All of that's going to take a while, so we're not going to really have room on the schedule for any work today. Sorry. Now, what is going on here? The instant gratification monkey does not seem like a guy you want behind the wheel. He lives entirely in the present moment. He has no memory of the past, no knowledge of the future, and he only cares about two things: easy and fun. Now, in the animal world, that works fine. If you're a dog and you spend your whole life doing nothing other than easy and fun things, you're a huge success. <coughs> And to the monkey, humans are just another animal species. He has to keep well slept, well fed, and propagating into the next generation, which in tribal times might have worked okay. But if you haven't noticed, now we're not in tribal times. We're in an advanced civilization, and the monkey does not know what that is. Which is why we have another guy in our brain, the rational decision maker, who gives us the ability to do things no other animal can do. We can. Visualize the future. We can see the big picture. We can make long-term plans, and he wants to take all of that into account. And he wants to just have us do whatever makes sense to be doing right now. Now, sometimes it makes sense to be doing things that are easy and fun, like when you're having dinner or going to bed or enjoying well-earned leisure time. That's why there's an overlap. Sometimes they agree, but other times it makes much more sense to be doing things. That are harder and less pleasant for the sake of the big picture, and that's when we have a conflict. And for the procrastinator, that conflict tends to end a certain way every time, leaving him spending a lot of time in this orange zone, an easy and fun place that's entirely out of the make sense circle. I call it the dark playground. <laughs> Now, the dark playground is a place that all of you procrastinators out there know very well. It's where leisure activities happen at times when leisure activities are not supposed to be happening. The fun you have in the dark playground isn't actually fun because it's completely unearned, and the air is filled with guilt, dread, anxiety, self-hatred, all those good procrastinator feelings. And the question is: In this situation, with the monkey behind the wheel, how does the procrastinator ever get himself over here to this blue zone, a less pleasant place, but where really important things happen? Well, turns out. That the procrastinator has a guardian angel, someone who's always looking down on him and watching over him in his darkest moments. Someone called the panic monster. <laughs> Now, the panic monster is dormant most of the time, 
but he suddenly wakes up. Any time a deadline gets too close, or there's danger of public embarrassment, a career disaster, or some other scary consequence, and importantly, he's the only thing that the monkey is terrified of. Now, he became very relevant in my life pretty recently, because the people of TED reached out to me about six months ago and invited me to do a TED talk. <laughs> Now, of course. I said yes. It's always been a dream of mine to have done a TED talk in the past. <laughs> But in the middle of all this excitement, the rational decision maker seemed to have something else in his mind. He was saying, "Are we clear on what we just accepted? Do we do we get?" What's going to be now happening one day in the future? We need to sit down and work on this right now. And the monkey said, "Totally agree, but also let's just open Google Earth and let's zoom into the bottom of India, like 200 feet above the ground, and we're going to scroll up for two and a half hours till we get to the top of the country, so we can get a better feel for India." <laughs> so that's what we did that day. As six months turned into four, and then two, and then one, the people of TED decided to release the speakers. And I opened up the website, and there was my face staring right back at me. And guess who woke up? <laughs> so the panic monster starts losing his mind, and a few seconds later, the whole system's in mayhem. <laughs> And the monkey, who remember, he's terrified of the panic monster. Boom! He's up the tree, and finally, finally, the rational decision maker can take the wheel, and I can start working on the talk. Now, the panic monster explains all kinds of pretty insane procrastinator behavior, like how someone like me could spend two weeks unable to start the opening sentence of a paper, and then miraculously find the unbelievable work ethic to stay up all night and write eight pages. And this entire situation with the three characters, this is the procrastinator's system. It's not pretty, but in the end, it works. And this is what I decided to write about on the blog just a couple of years ago. Now, when I did, I was amazed by the response. Literally, thousands of emails came in from all different kinds of people from all over the world, doing all different kinds of things. These were people who were nurses and bankers and painters and engineers and lots and lots of PhD students. <laughs> And they were all writing, saying the same thing. I have this problem too. But what struck me was the contrast between the light tone of the post and the heaviness of these emails. These people were writing with intense frustration about what procrastination had done to their lives, about what this monkey had done to them. And I thought about this, and I said, well, if the procrastinator system works, then what's going on? Why are all these people in such a dark place? Well, it turns out that there's two kinds of procrastination. Everything I've talked about today, the examples I've given, they all have deadlines. And when there's deadlines, the effects of procrastination are contained to the short term because the panic monster gets involved. But there's a second kind of procrastination that happens in situations when there is no deadline. So, if you want to have a career where you want to be a self-starter, something in the arts, something entrepreneurial. There's no deadlines on those things at first, because nothing's happening at first. Not until you've gone out and done the hard work to get some momentum to get things going. There's also all kinds of important things outside of your career that don't involve any deadlines, like seeing your family or exercising and taking care of your health, working on your relationship, or getting out of a relationship that isn't working. Now, if the procrastinator's only mechanism of doing these hard things is the panic monster, that's a problem, because in all of these non-deadline situations. The panic monster doesn't show up. He has nothing to wake up for. So the effects of procrastination—they're not contained. They just extend outward forever. And it's this long-term kind of procrastination that's much less visible and much less talked about than the funnier short-term deadline-based kind. It's usually suffered quietly and privately, and it can be the source of a huge amount of long-term unhappiness and regrets. And I thought, you know, that's why these people are emailing, and that's why they're in such a bad place. It's not that they're cramming for some project; it's that long-term procrastination has made them feel like a spectator at times in their own lives. You know, the frustration is not that they couldn't achieve their dreams; it's that they weren't even able to start chasing them. So, I 
read these emails and I had a little bit of an epiphany that I don't think non-procrastinators exist. That's right. I think all of you are procrastinators. Now, you might not all be a mess, like some of us, and some of you may have a healthy relationship with deadlines. But remember, the monkey's sneakiest trick is when the deadlines aren't there. Now, I want to show you one last thing. I call this a life calendar. That's one box for every week of a 90-year life. That's not that many boxes, especially since we've already used a bunch of those. So I think we need to all take a long, hard look at that calendar. We need to think about what we're really procrastinating on, because everyone is procrastinating on something in life. We need to stay aware of the instant gratification monkey. That's a job for all of us, and because there's not that many boxes on there, it's a job that should probably start today. Well, maybe not today, but <laughs> you know, sometime soon. Thank you. All right, so how many can relate? I can relate a lot to that. Yeah, <laughs> a lot, way too much. We all can More. relate, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right, let's get back to our uh, PowerPoint presentation. All right, can everyone see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Perfect, awesome. Okay, so communication barriers. Care of patients with special language, cultural and religious needs. Um, time in the country. Non-native speakers. Degree of personal space. Degree of public modesty. Variances in use of nonverbal communication. Cultural practices related to health and social interactions. And a caregiver's cultural assumptions based on personal cultural set rather than patient's cultural. I think sometimes that's difficult because we aren't all entirely um, knowledgeable or educated about multiple different cultures or religions. And I think that's something that maybe in the healthcare field, it's our responsibility that we should um, maybe get to know three or four important items um, about a person's culture or, or their religion. So general approach psychosocial, use an interpreter when possible. And, and this is huge, especially if you're in an emergent um, or kind of a trauma situation, something where it's important that family members or that the patient really understand what's going on. Uh, Alessandra, I, I'm sure in L&D, maybe you've seen this before. I know I did when I worked in L&D for a couple of years, but patients may come in that are refugees that may may not understand you know what's going on um the the fact that they have access to an epidural and a spinal that they can have pain medications um a c-section can sometimes be absolutely terrifying to those patients because anytime in their country when people have had c-sections they die because of hemorrhaging to death right that there may be may not have been medical um, practices that were safe in their country. 
Um, keep your voice volume and tone calm and quiet. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I think that in the past we've all kind of seen that talk louder and slower. That's such a falsehood. They aren't hard of hearing. Um, they may just not be able to understand our language, right? So you want to keep it calm and quiet. Avoid hand gestures. Maintain a careful distance and minimize contact unless the patient initiates or responds favorably. Make provision for privacy as often as possible. Provide as much information as possible in the simplest terms possible. Move and speak slowly. And again, I, I for me, I may be wrong. I speak fast. Um, but speak slowly in a respectful way. Provide friendly, calm, comfort, and warm reassurance. Provide continuous updates to the patient and family. Allow cultural and religious practices as much as possible. Pay attention to the needs of the patient. Care being given by persons of the opposite sex may be unacceptable to the patient. And I kind of mentioned that a couple times today. Um, you may have a patient that does not want a male scrub tech, that may not want a male surgeon or a, a male CRNA. And same, same with a, a female. We see it more where they may not want a male, but it can, it can definitely go both directions. All right, physical care. Body structure or a particular ethnic group can vary in size, skin and hair color, or in genetic predisposition to a particular illness. Fear of medication may inhibit patient from following doctor's orders. If procedure calls for blood transfusions, and this is against the patient's cultural or religious beliefs, the surgical team needs to have equipment available to allow for auto transfusion. And in the OR, I showed you the cell saver machine. And that's the exact machine that they're talking about in this type of situation. Hospital clothing may be unacceptable to some females in certain cultures. Under environmental, um, typical cultural variances. I think I may have missed a slide there, I apologize. All right, and these are just kind of some uh, information or knowledge about some different cultures. Um, African, so expressive, they may be quite open about experiencing pain. Um, they enjoy and expect touch, not extremely private. Concern is primarily here and now. They have strong ties to family, community, and church. Asian, silence between moments of conversation is expected and allows for thought. Prefer the absolute minimum contact. Personal privacy extends to any body exposure. Fairly stoic, not given to complaint. So be cautious in assuming comfort level or pain of a patient. Checking with family members to gauge past behaviors with current ones. Avoid hand gestures and limit eye contact, which is considered disrespectful. Um, bloody and body part sensitivity. Agreement of yes may only indicate the statement is true or respect for the speaker, not that it's the patient's desire. The oldest male of the family will be the decision maker, so any medical requests or forms of consent must go to that individual. So as I'm sure in these slides, I don't want to create a generalization. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you have an Asian patient, don't, don't assume that this is going to be, that it's going to fit them one-on-one. 
Same with an African patient. Don't assume that this fits them 101. And I'm just sharing this information because I, I want you as a healthcare provider to be respectful and to kind of keep an open mind of patients that may not have the same cultural or religious background or beliefs as you do. European, Northern Europeans, most often stoic and reserved, often unwilling to express pain. Low contact, primary focus is on future benefit, not present pain. Very independent with no strong matriarchal or patriarchal influence. Southern Europeans, warm, friendly, emotional, and high contact. Primary focus is on sociability and present gains. Prime value is on children, then loyalty to nuclear family and community. Strong patriarchal system with oldest male, often the decision maker. Jewish American, avoid touching as much as practicable, practicable, particularly between sexes. Be aware of kosher needs and the great concern for both food and contact restrictions. Blood has great significance. Generally opposed to organ donations or autopsies for body to be whole for resurrection. Jewish males may wear skull caps. Mexican American, see Southern Europeans, uh, Middle Eastern. Personal modesty is critical. Deeply religious people. Blood has great significance. Native American or First Nations, um, reserved and quiet. Avoid eye contact, which is a sign of disrespect. Expect silence and less focus on time. Extremely tied to family and heritage. All right, so that kind of finishes that up. And again, this is kind of research that Mona and I have done that medical people have seen over time in the medical field. Please do not take this information and assume that every single patient that may fit into that category will respond that way, right? Each, again, each person has their own story. Um, and, and even though they may look like they're one particular culture, they may not have any of that particular background. So just kind of keep an open mind. All right, so the three phases of secondary trauma family and surgical team may have caring for at the death of a chronic or terminal patient. So a psychological response, and this, is, this kind of overlaps from last week, um, experience a variety of emotions as coping mechanisms, right? So you're gonna go through denial, empathy, fear, frustration, guilt, sadness, sympathy, Withdrawal, uh, behavior response. Behaviors are often reactive instead of proactive. So defense mechanisms, aggression. And again, this, if, if you're standing there, hopefully you're never put into a situation to have to tell a family member um, that their family member isn't gonna make it off the table. Um, and don't ever take anything personally if you are there because you may see some aggression, um, some anger, uh, compensation, comp conversion, displacement, identification, projection, rationalization, reaction formation, and regression. And it finishes up with repression. Sublimation, substance use, suppression, All right, next is coping strategies. So what do you do for stress removal, relaxation? Exercise, um, participate in hobbies. Recovery, so face negative thoughts, emotions or experiences head on, then creatively, creatively work to resolve the root causes for discomfort or pain. Work through the pain, grief, and suffering. Transition to growth. Acquire new meaning and purpose in life and in living. Assist others in the process. Be patient with others and with self. Use a caring, gentle tone of voice. 
actively listen and show interest, and encourage good self-care by all involved, including regular sleep and healthy nutrition. So again, as you enter your healthcare career, um, you're probably gonna face some really tough days. Um, and you need to find some good coping strategies, right? And there'll be days where, where you may blame yourself. Oh, if, if I would have done this better, if I would have done that better. And there's two different ways that you can handle that. You know, you can kind of stew on it and really struggle with it, or you can grow from it. So, hey, next time I work with this provider, you know, and we're doing this case, I'm gonna make sure that I have this sternal saw in the room, right? Um, or I'm gonna make sure that I have this clamp in the room just in case this happens again. So through every single difficult day, try to grow from it. So you'll also work with, and I kind of talked about this in our hospital tour, you kind of grow together as family with your coworkers because you kind of go through some tough times together. Um, so they may use you as a sounding board simply because your family members don't understand or their family members don't understand. Um, so when, it, you know, when a coworker comes to you, empathize, sympathize, but don't, don't try to take on that baggage as well. Extend open and honest feedback without being harsh or judgmental. Provide an environment of trust and acceptance draw out feelings and examine responses or behaviors, mirror back information that enables others to see themselves more clearly, maintain hope and nourish sim simple joy and nourish simple joy in life. Um, and they do have support groups for staff members. We've done debriefings before where they brought in counselors. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, oh, how many years ago was it? Maybe three or four. And there was a man who came into, or, or who broke into a little girl's birthday party. And I can't remember how old she was. And he started stabbing all the kids. Um, and I was on call that night and it, it, was, it was a mass casualty. Um, anyway, there was a few deaths. And I think he was just barely sentenced maybe this year. Um, but, St. Al's brought in counselors and did debriefings and everything else simply because we, I've been there 22 years and we have never experienced anything like that before where number one, um, there were so many people involved and the large amount of people were children. And so it, it, you know, uh, what do I want to say? It can affect you pretty tremendously. Um, you know, you can have nightmares afterwards, uh, you kind of blame yourself that you didn't think of a solution or, hey, if I had done this, et cetera, et cetera. So just make sure that you don't internalize all that stuff, figure out a way to work through it, whether it be hiking, whether it be, you know, if you're an extrovert, I think, you know, you fill your buckets by um, hanging out with friends and family members. Uh, if you're an introvert, you listen to music, you draw, you know, what, whatever it is, find a way to be able to work through some of those emotions that you may um, feel in this career. Uh, support groups for bereaved families, availability of a chaplain or, cl or clergy, um, and staff does have access to the chaplain. All right, so here's the DNR. And I kind of wanted to cover this section because although you guys did really well, um, I think there was some slight confusion on DNR. Let's go over it real fast. So a DNR order indicates the patient and or family has decided to decline life-saving efforts. The official order is charted in the patient's medical records after the DNR document has been signed by the patient or family member. So the DNR has to be put in the medical records and it has to be signed either by the patient or a family member. It can be incorporated into an advanced directive or by informing hospital staff. Many types of surgery provide palliative benefits to patients who will either not survive long-term or who do not wish resuscitation in the OR. So the procedures that can and cannot be performed should be de designed to prevent ambiguity. Um, and that's a big thing that when you're in the OR, if you have a patient that says, if I die on the table, I don't want any resuscitation, 
everyone in that room needs to know that. There's going to be zero resuscitation because your CRNA may go to lunch, right? Or your nurse may go to lunch. So someone in that room needs to stay informed. Unless instructions for a DNR are in effect, hospital staff will make every effort to help patients whose hearts have stopped or who have stopped breathing. Ethical issues may arise if a DNR order is not in place and when the decision is left to the family members. Patients who benefit from a DNR order are those who have terminal or other debilitating illnesses. Most facilities policies require that the DNR be renewed with each hospital admission to confirm that the order still represents the patient and family's decision to decline life-saving efforts. So truly that is something that has to be covered every single time a patient comes in. It can't just be, oh, well, they were a DNR, you know, when they were in here three weeks ago. It's talked about with their provider and then it's discussed again. All right, any questions? Questions, concerns? So perioperative, understand that it covers preoperative, right, which is before surgery. So that's when you're in the pre-op area, um, having your IV, signing consents. Intraoperative, that's in the OR. And then postoperative, when you're in the PACU or recovery. And I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but skin turgor, it's the resistance of the skin to, deform, um, to deformation. So your elderly patients, um, you know, those who may have burns, you really want to be careful of. All right. I want to go over test three quickly. Was everyone able to find the AORN video in Surge 103? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, did you all see that I added the study guide and essentially the information about AORN, um, the AORN video on the module? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Has anyone taken the post test yet? No. Not yet. No? Okay. So after the post test is a little piece of paper, and yes, I know it's there. Um, I would recommend that you do the post test and then look at that little piece of paper at the end of the post test. that make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Or did I just create more confusion? It's in the same document, right? Say it again. It's in the same document, you're, the piece of paper you're talking about? It is. Yes, it's in the same document. So it's a long document, kind of goes over everything that's covered in the video. At the very end of that document, is the answers to your post test okay so i am telling you study the post test know what the correct answers are everybody got it i'm trying to give you little hints all through my lecture so <clears throat> hold on to that stuff And I'm telling you this because the ARN videos are great, but they are not information that will be tested on your certification exam. So I want you to know it. 
understand it, but at the same time, if I give you a post-test, I want to get you the answers so that you'll know that they're correct. Okay, let me know if you can see the test. Yes. Yeah, I can see it. Perfect. All right, so which of the following diagnosis is currently used in most jurisdictions of the world to define a state of irrever irreversible death? And that's whole brain death. Which of the following is not one of the five stages of grief, repression? And I'm just gonna go through these super fast. If you have any questions, speak up. What type of procedure or care provides a terminal patient with symptom relief or avoidance and improves quality of the remaining life expectancy? And that's palliative care. Which of the following terms represents a positive physical and psychological state of a patient? Eustress. Under which circumstances would many hospitals rescind a do not resuscitate or a DNR and a patient must undergo a therapeutic surgical procedure? Which of the following is not a form of advanced directive? And that's document of self-actualization. Maslow's research produced a hierarchical structure of human progression. For what type of research was Sister Calista Roy best known? And that's the adaptation model. For what type of research was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross best known? Five stages of grief. Which type of general category of death would most likely generate high emotional trauma for family members and a need to follow protocols for preservation of evidence in the perioperative period? That's accidental. Which of the following terms describes a set of therapies that preserves a patient's life when body systems are not functioning sufficiently? It's life support. Which of the following legislative rulings requires medical facilities to inform patients of their rights to choose the types and extent of medical care available and their legal right to advance directives? And that's Patient Self-Determination Act. Who would be responsible for seeking consent from family members for organ donation after a patient is determined to have suffered whole brain death? And that's the facility's gift of life coordinator. I think I mentioned that in my lecture. Uh, which of the following needs identified by Maslow would likely be most prominent in a surgical patient's mind? That's safety. Which of the following levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the pinnacle and can be accomplished only when all other needs are met? That's self-actualization. Which of the following religions typically prohibits its followers from receiving blood transfusions? Jehovah Witness. Which organs or tissues can be recovered after death or after a patient has already been removed from life support? That's bone. A person with only basic physiological functions of respiration, blood pressure, and heartbeat intact is categorized as having suffered which kind of death? And that's higher brain. Which of the following religions believes in reincarnation and that the rebirth, and that the rebirth is influenced by the previous death experience and that's Buddhism. Denial, rationalization, regression, and repression are common forms of what type of mechanisms? Coping, and we just kind of covered that again. Which of the following needs of the surgical patient is related to the identification and understanding of an individual's place in the universe and may include his or her views on theology, philosophy, or mythology? And that's spiritual. Which of the following needs of the surgical patient is related to anatomy and physiology, genetics and pathology, physical? Which of the following procedures would be surgical treatment for an elderly patient's physiological dissatisfaction? That'd be a blepharoplasty and a rhidectomy. What does Sister Calista Roy define as all conditions, circumstances, and influences that surround and affect the development and behavior of the person? And that's environment. 
Which area of concern or fear would most likely be the main focus for a toddler scheduled for surgery? And that's abandonment. And that can be also the PTSD that we talked about earlier today. Which area of concern or fear would most likely be the main focus for a teenage patient having surgery? Body image. Teenagers, of course, struggle with their body as they're going through puberty. Uh, the patient statement, I know I will be in a better place, is part of the acceptance stage of grief. Which of the following conditions um, was defined by the Harvard School of Medicine and includes the following physical signs, um, flat EEG, unresponsiveness, lowered body temperature, and absent pupil reflexes, and that's your whole brain death. Um, and that's what we talk about, and, and you may hear this a lot in the OR, they talk about blown, um, blown pupils. And it's usually those ones that have, may have had a brain aneurysm or have had a pretty, pretty significant uh, traumatic brain injury, you know, whether it was from a car accident or um, maybe they were assaulted. Um, and that's one of the big things that you'll hear anesthesia say is, oh, you know, well, their left pupils blown. And so what that means is that they don't have reflexes, that they have a pretty significant brain injury and that their brain may be herniating. SIDS, formerly known as crib death, is categorized as which general category of cause of death? It's sudden. What type of life support treatment would be considered ultimately futile and its benefits far outweighed by the financial and emotional burdens suffered by the family and healthcare system? That's extraordinary. A terminally ill patient whose advanced directive is to refuse any life-saving efforts by healthcare workers is choosing which type of euthanasia? And that's passive. What is a normal emotion that surgical team members may feel for their patients but must not interfere with their abilities to maintain focus on their jobs, particularly in all hazards situation? And that's empathy. A patient may be considered a candidate for donation after cardiac death, a DCD if his or her heart is predicted to cease functioning within what period of time after removal from mechanical support? That's 90 minutes. And recognition of which religion's death rites would the operating room staff allow the deceased patient's son or other relative to close the eyes and mouth and wash the body after removal from the surgical suite? That's Jewish. The death of a patient from complications of asthma or high blood pressure would be categorized as which general category of cause of death? That's prolonged. Use Maslow's hierarchy of needs and assess the most important patient, for, um, patient priority. And of course, that was the patient with a compromised airway. We kind of talked about that last week. The following would be considered a genetic malformation factor for surgical intervention, um, and that's I'm not gonna be able to say it right. Keliosisis. Keliosisis, sorry. Uh, the following would be listed as disease factor for surgical intervention, and that's cholecystitis. A patient who is dying states, it can't be happening to me, is an example of the Kubler-Ross stage of denial. A DNR or a DNI is written by a Physician initiated by the patient. I'm sorry, did someone say something? A blank allows a patient to state in writing exactly what medical interventions they are willing to endure to sustain life. That's a living will. Advanced directives are made up of which of the following two legal documents? And that's your power attorney and your living will. And this was the one that it, if, if a question was missed on the test, it was probably this one. Um, and the big thing to remember is that a DNR is done in the hospital. And, and it's usually done with a provider or a nurse, um, but the provider has to put it in the chart. So just make sure you understand that. The surgical team in preparation for an ectopic pregnancy of a female patient who is Jehovah Witness must be concerned with the fact that the patient's beliefs do not allow blood transfusions. The following religion does not allow birth control, and that's Roman Catholic. 
Which of the following is a cause of surgical intervention? And it's all of the choices. A surgical technologist should always introduce himself or herself in a professional manner so as to put the patient at ease. Maslow believed that if all of a person's safety needs are not met, that person will not be free to move on to the next level and care for another individual. A condition that is long lasting is chronic. Always treat a surgical patient as a person. The most basic needs in Maslow's hierarchy of needs are physiological. All right, any questions or concerns? Must be a negative. Okay, can everyone see? this PowerPoint project? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to quickly go over it because again, if you have time, you can do it this week. I don't care. You don't have to wait till week six. I don't care when you do it. None of the material that we cover in that week will have anything to do with this PowerPoint slide. Okay. So requirements for the presentation, you must have a title slide and a conclusion slide. There must be at least 13 body slides. This means your presentation must have a minimum of 15 slides in total. Um, don't exceed 20 slides. I love you guys as students, but I, I'm good with 20 slides about yourself. Uh, use several different slide layouts throughout your presentation. Add pictures. Um, so anyways, you can do anything you want. And again, honestly, I'm not going to grade it if you didn't do all of those. I don't need to know your age if you want to share it, great. If you want to share your birthday, great. If you want to share your birthplace, great. But again, it's not, you don't need to um, check mark all of those, okay? This is the rubric of how I'm going to grade it. So 30% or 15 points will be formatting. 15 or 30% will be organization. And then 20 points or 40% is gonna be your grammar. And I'm doing that because I want, I want you guys to take the time and make it look nice. And also when you turn in your resume at hospitals for jobs, please really make sure that it's very professional, right? No spelling errors, uh, make sure that punctuation is correct, all of that type of stuff. Does anybody have any questions about the PowerPoint presentation? As you can see, it's due on July 18th. No questions? Is everybody still alive or did everyone melt? I'm still doing okay. Still here. Okay, good. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to end class with this last little video. Um, I don't know, and I'll tell you this, Mona and Eric handle all this stuff. I don't know where all of you were ranked um, as the 18 students. I don't know who was an alternative. I don't know who was number one. I don't know who was number 12. But those numbers don't matter, and the word alternative doesn't matter anymore. All 18 of you made it into this program for a reason. And that means that we as instructors have all the faith in the world in you that you will be successful scrub tech by the time you graduate from this program. So this summer I know is busy for everybody. I know most of you work, you all have family, um, and, and you're in, in at least two classes, if not more. So I know it gets tough. And if you think I'm talking to you, I guarantee you I've had two other students contact me with the same type of concerns, okay? Maybe not the exact same, but they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, as you get into fall semester and spring semester, it, it, it's pretty busy. And we kind of see these from, you know, see it from students that they may get burnt out 
or, or they're like, forget it, I'm not doing this, this is too much. Let me tell you how I kind of made it through college. Never, and I'll, and I'll relate it to you guys. Never will it be June 30th, 2021, and you'll be having to hear one of my lectures again, right? So every single day you guys make it through a class, every single day that you write some sort of case study for Eric's class is something you'll never have to do again. So just do it as a check mark and just know, hey, I'm just gonna get this done, I'm gonna get it out of the way and I'm not gonna have to worry about it after this week. So anyways, I wanted to finish about this video because it is gonna take a lot of grit and a lot of passion and perseverance to get through this program, but we as instructors have all the faith in the world and know that you guys can do it or else we wouldn't have allowed you into our program. I have a So we're just gonna end, hit it. Sorry, about the um, presentation, it says slides will be automatically set advanced math length is two minutes. I don't know that I'm sorry, say it again. It says slides will be set automatically advanced. Max length is two minutes. So Correct. I don't know what that means. It, and again, okay, let me go back to that real fast. Yeah, so are you asking what that means? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So again, you don't have, you don't have to do this. Um, so when you do a presentation, or when you do a PowerPoint presentation, um, you can set it to where your slides will automatically advance. And so max length is two minutes on each slide. Okay, thank you. Does that make, does that make sense? Which yeah, again, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> I was no, like, good. how do we go through 20 max slides yeah. in two minutes? That's a lot. No. Yeah. And you may have one slide that takes two minutes and you may have another slide that takes 10 seconds, but truly don't, don't stress about this whatsoever. And I know it says that this project may be presented to the class. It will not be in the summer. So, so, so don't worry about it. It's just, it's kind of a get to know you for us as um, instructors. Just, and that's it. All right. Thank you. You bet. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, yes. Okay, and, and truly this is, this is just a little pep talk. Well, I know you guys can make it through this program. I know you can make it through this summer. Try to get through one day at a time and just know that it will fly by. So after this week is over, you're halfway done. And then we only have three more weeks of lectures and then you have your final. So it'll fly by. The streaming home of, plus so much more. Um, did it pause for everyone else, or? Yeah, yeah I can't see anything. Yeah, they just kind of stuck there.
All right. Can everyone see it now? Yes. Yeah, but it's still kind of yeah, like stuck in still. Okay, there we go. All right. There we go. All right. We got it. No, we can't hear it. Can't hear it at all. What struck me was that IQ was not the only there difference we go. between my best and my worst students. All right. Ooh. Here we go. When I was 27 years old, I left a very demanding job in management consulting for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests, I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily. So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling League and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires, and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out, that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping in. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, 
how little science knows about building it. Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. What I do know is that talent doesn't make you great. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm gonna end my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. Challenge the past. Challenge accepted. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And it, and it is a really good book. She's a great speaker. I think she's now a professor at University of Pennsylvania, I think. But, okay, so I've covered a lot of topics today, showed you a couple of videos to, to just kind of break things up. And anybody have any questions? Because you have hung out with me in this 100 degree classroom all day today, uh, I'm going to go over a couple of test questions. Okay. So here is one of them. Which classification of antibiotics is contraindicated for use in neonates due to increased incidence of kernecterus? All right, can everybody hear me? Yes, can you repeat, please? You bet. Here is the question. Which classification of antibiotics is contraindicated for use in neonates due to increased incidence of kernicterus? And it's K-E-R-N-I-C-T-E-R-U-S. <clears throat> this is one of the more okay. difficult questions. So Go ahead, Ray. Could you repeat this? Yeah, you please? bet. And in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write it in our little chat. Awesome. I like that. There we go. <laughs> yes, thanks. Is everybody able to use Cengage slash MindTap? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Does anybody know the answer before I give it? All right, and there's your answer. Sulfonamides. Okay, and I know that that's covered in your book. I just read it read it for I don't know the millionth time um, the end of last week 
Okay, so make sure you do your Cengage mind tap, read your chapter, watch the AORN video, um, and then go over the material that I posted about the AORN video and do the post test and make sure you know the answers for those questions and then do your module. So the exam opens Friday morning and closes Sunday night at midnight. Please remember that when you do your Cengage and MindTap, if you do chapters one through five, and in the to-do section, if you do the multiple choice, true, false, and certification style questions, and you get 90% or above, you will get 25 extra credit points. Do not do the essays, whatever you do. I will not be grading them. Just don't do them. So it's the multiple choice, the matching. Yeah, so multiple choice, the true faults, and the certification style questions. So not the matching, just true false, multiple choice, certification. Correct. All righty, thank you. You bet. Okay. Here's one last question from the test, and then I'm going to let you guys go. So the question states, all of the following national agencies have regulations or protocols for healthcare workers who may be exposed to infectious diseases in their work environment except. And your options are CDC, NIOSH, NFPA or OSHA? Anyone want to take a guess? Is it the third one? Oh. It is! Yeah! Heck, I shouldn't be giving you guys this. Nice job! Okay, just like I'm typing it out in our chat. Um, I know that Jordan is talking about doing a DaVinci in service with the rep. If you guys can make that, uh, the DaVinci robot's pretty incredible. And um, I would say 90% of the healthcare facilities in the Treasure Valley has at least one, if not two, and some hospitals have three. Um, and that is used often in treatment, uh, you know, in surgery. So that is lots of fun. The rep is great. Her, her name is Alex and she does a great presentation. So whenever Jordan is able to schedule that, I would say make every opportunity to go. It's a pretty neat uh, experience to be able to see the Da Vinci up close and personal. So, okay, anything else? I appreciate everyone sticking around today. No. Thank you All very right. much. All right. Well, have a good. Yeah, hey, you, you bet. Have have a awesome Fourth of July. Please don't drink and drive. Um, call a driver, just because we don't need you in the hospital. Um, but besides that, have a safe and happy Fourth, and I'll see you guys in a week. You Thank too. you. Thank you.